Hello all and welcome to this online presentation in which we will discuss critically appraising case control studies um, and we'll talk about uh, two templates uh, in which we can use to perform a critical appraisal of case control studies. So the first template um, is one that we've based on the uh, JAMA uh, user's guide uh, to the medical literature um, and it's fairly similar uh, in terms of uh, the questions asked um, to the previous presentation which we presented on how to critically appraise uh, studies of uh, harm using um, either cohort studies or randomised controlled trials. Having said that, there is a, a slight difference between the two um, and that slight difference relates to uh, the first point in which we're asking are the results of this study valid? So running through the questions, the first question asks how were cases defined and controls chosen? And this obviously relates to uh, an aspect of selection bias. We want to identify um, what the, I guess, inclusion criteria, so to speak, is of the cases and the controls, how they were identified and and how they were identified is relevant here because it will uh, relate uh, back to um, the generalizability of the study itself. So we want to have detailed information of what criteria was met in order to be defined as a case, um, likewise for a control and how those cases and controls were chosen. The second question, how was the exposure or exposures identified across the two groups and secondly, was this consistent? So we want to identify that uh, exposure um, uh, was consistent in terms of its, its measurement across the two groups. Uh, so there's no difference there. Um, that of course relates to detection bias. Uh, but primarily we want to identify how was exposure actually um, determined. Um, so did it rely on um, accessing uh, medical records? Um, or any other sort of clinical data, which would obviously uh, have a much lower tendency um, uh, or, or potential for recall or response bias, or did it rely on uh, patient um, interviews, uh, which uh, of course would potentially increase the risk of recall and response bias in terms of determining exposure based on patient comment and recall. The third and fourth questions uh, relating to the methodology of the study. Um, uh, so the, the third question, did the investigators measure all known confounders in the cases and controls? So again, we can look at um, the, the baseline characteristics um, and try and um, match up uh, the cases and controls in terms of uh, the demographics. So in terms of age, sex, other comorbidities, other risk factors. And if there are any differences, which um, you know, can be the case, um, there has been statistical analyses uh, done in order to adjust for any differences between the two groups. That way, um, if we do have a, a difference in terms of the exposure and the outcome, we can be assured that any differences uh, between the um, exposure and the outcome is attributed to the actual exposure and not to any other confounding factor. And finally, uh, we ask what type of case control study was performed? And we ask that question because we want to identify are there any limitations associated with this design? So as I mentioned, we can have case control studies in which we um, uh, basically rely on patient data to identify exposures and, and, and particular outcomes. We can have um, case control studies that have been nested within um, other studies, for example, nested within uh, a randomised control trial um, or nested within a cohort study. Um, we can have uh, case control studies in which the data has been linked uh, to various databases. So um, that type of uh, data collection and, and case control study is going to be uh, somewhat more ro robust um, than, than a, a study that um, hasn't been uh, linked in terms of uh, its data collection. The second aspect of the critical appraisal, uh, again, uh, asks what are the results? So once again, because we're relying on a, a case control uh, study design, uh, we can't um, calculate the, the relative risk um, as our um, data collection is retrospective. So we have to rely on the odds ratio. So the first point asks, 
what is the odds ratio again if our odds ratio is less than one it would uh, seem that our exposure is not harmful if our odds ratio is above one then our exposure is harmful and if our odds ratio is one then there's no uh, difference um, between the exposure in terms of harm or benefit the second question asks how strong is the association be expo between exposure and outcome um, and here again we can just um, uh, de describe our odds ratio so if, if we for example had an odds ratio of 1.5 we could uh, state that um, the exposure is associated with a 1.5 times increase in the risk of whatever the um, outcome may be. Um, or similarly, when we're reporting a, a relative risk reduction or increase, we can use the same sort of uh, uh, principle here. Uh, again, if we had a, an odds ratio of 1.5, we can uh, manipulate the words and, and uh, describe that by saying that um, exposure to this particular risk factor will increase your risk of whatever the outcome might be by 50%. The third question asks how precise is the estimate of the risk um, and once again this is um, looking at the uh, confidence intervals so once again if the confidence intervals um, uh, include uh, one uh, we would indicate that there's no statistical uh, difference between uh, the two groups uh, that being the cases and the controls um, if it did not include one uh, then again this would uh, indicate significant statistical difference between the two groups once again, if our confidence intervals are wide, um, this would indicate that the sample size is small, so our uh, study um, is less than precise than uh, a larger study which would um, have smaller uh, confidence intervals. Our third question specifically relates, relates to uh, studies around harm um, and, and causation. So do the results satisf satisfy some diagnostic tests for causation? So the first question asks, is it clear that the exposure preceded the onset of the outcome? Um, so once again, this will be uh, fairly obvious um, in a lot of cases. Um, for example, if we, we use the uh, uh, example of uh, vasectomy and prostate cancer, obviously exposure being uh, vasectomy um, and the onset of the outcome being uh, prostate cancer. So obviously uh, if we had prostate cancer before uh, the vasectomy, uh, it will rule out that uh, particular question and rule out um, the case for causation. Is there a dose response gradient? Once again, uh, this relates to um, more commonly pharmaceutical um, exposures. Um, it, it could also relate to other um, environmental um, exposures or occupational exposures so something like heat um, you know working in, a, in an environment at 30 degrees compared to 50 degrees compared to 60 degrees um, would potentially uh, provide a dose response gradient um, and finally is there any positive evidence from a D challenge re challenge study um, uh, so again uh, this question may be difficult and, and not applicable to a lot of cases uh, in the event that we um, uh, are providing the exposure and, and seeing what effect it has on the outcome and then if possible the, the re-challenge strategy being what happens when we remove the exposure. So once again for, for something like a, um, a case control study um, this may not be possible depending on the type of exposure um, uh, that we have. Finally, uh, question four relates to the generalizability. So how can we apply the results to this patient? Um, so are the patient, or is the patient in, in, in the particular clinical scenario that we've got similar or different to the patients um, in the case control study? What was the magnitude or seriousness of the risk? So this is where we can refer to uh, our number needed to harm. Um, and our final question relates to the overall uh, weighing up of the benefits and the risks of exposure. So um, should an attempt made uh, to stop the exposure um, or in the unlikely scenario, um, should we continue exposure if there seems to be some sort of benefit, uh, beneficial outcome? Finally, we can always use our 
gate f uh, framework. Um, so w one of the beauties of using the gate framework and the, and the Rambo uh, technique um, is that you can use it across any um, of the RCT, uh, cohort or case control uh, study designs um, in terms of its um, application. So in this scenario we're, we're basing it on a study by Debley uh, which, uh, in which the authors uh, investigated uh, childhood asthma hospitalisation um, after um, caesarean uh, delivery. So if we run through it quickly uh, using the GATE framework, our first question uh, asks um, or relates to um, representation uh, from, the, from the RAMBO. So in this case, um, uh, the authors um, uh, used uh, or had access to over 2,000 cases and 8,000 controls of um, uh, pregnant women and uh, their subsequent uh, babies in terms of delivery um, and outcome being uh, asthma. So in terms of um, how they were allocated um, uh, uh, and, and, and where they were sourced from, the cases were uh, sourced from a, um, a hospital database um, and controls were a selection of children born uh, during the same birth years without asthma. So our cases um, and controls have been clearly identified. Um, in terms of attrition bias or, or, or um, attrition in, in this case uh, relating to the Rambo technique. Um, we don't have any attrition. Uh, it's one of the beauties of a case control studies. Uh, as mentioned, data collection is retrospective, so the outcome has already occurred, so we're not going to have any uh, attrition bias. So of the 10,000 odd um, potential um, cases and controls, um, 10,000 completed the study. Uh, again, we've uh, identified our exposure group, so 2,028 um, cases um, of, of asthma um, and then 8,292 um, controls, so random selection of children without asthma. Um, and with this particular study, uh, they were able to uh, link uh, the data to various databases within um, hospitals. Uh, so that, I guess, has further strength strengthened um, uh, the, the, the data linkage and the data collection. Um, and uh, the investigators were able to identify um, with fairly minimal um, recall response and detection bias, um, exposure and um, outcome status. So if we then divide um, the particular um, cases and controls in terms of their um, exposures, uh, of the 2,028 um, uh, cases, uh, 385 in this particular case uh, had a caesarean section as opposed to 1,643 that did not. And of the controls, uh, 1,239 had a caesarean section and 7,053 uh, did not. So when we go to calculating our odds ratio, uh, we get an odds ratio of 1.33. So in this case, our odds ratio would su suggest that uh, a caesarean sec uh, sorry, a caesarean delivery um, of um, uh, both term and preterm infants um, is associated with a 33% uh, increase in the risk of it. Thank you for your time and as always please feel free to uh, email me if you have any questions.